In this video, we will show how to find complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a square matrix. We will center our discussion on this theorem, which says if lambda is an eigenvalue of a real n by a matrix A, and if x vector is a corresponding eigenvector, then lambda bar is also an eigenvalue of A, and x bar is a corresponding eigenvector. Now both lambda bar and x bar are usually written just as you say them, with a bar on top of lambda and a bar on top of the x vector. That simply means the complex conjugate of lambda and x vector. So in other words, this uh, theorem really states that if a real matrix has complex eigenvalues, then those eigenvalues and their corresponding eigenvectors must occur in conjugate pairs. And by recognizing that fact, we can save ourselves some work. So let's first find the uh, eigenvalues and bases for the eigenspaces of this two by two matrix. And we proceed as we normally would. We would just create a characteristic equation based on the structure of lambda i minus a and taking the determinant of that structure. And if we were to set those expressions equal to zero, we have a characteristic equation. So that would certainly reveal in this case that the eigenvalues are lambda equals i and lambda equals negative i. And those are complex conjugates, as the theorem said they should be. Now when we set up a linear system, a homogeneous linear system, we could use either eigenvalue to start. I chose lambda equals i. And when I put i into the structure, we get this system. That's interesting. How do we know that this system has non-trivial solutions? Well, if you recall, a theorem in the past that we considered was the number of distinct eigenvalues. We have two distinct eigenvalues for a two by two square matrix. So we know that this system will have non-trivial solutions for each eigenvalue. And what that really means when we take the reduced row echelon form of this system is that we must have a row of zeros in the uh, coefficient matrix. That's the only way to get non-trivial solutions. We can't have ones on the main diagonal that would result in just the trivial solution, the zero vector. And that can't be for this case. We're looking for eigenvectors. So we know that each row in the coefficient matrix must be a scalar multiple of the other. And we can exploit that fact as we try to solve for the eigenvector family. So we want to look carefully and see how row operations can be used to get a row of zeros on the bottom of this augmented matrix, which represents that linear system we spoke about. And this again is for when lambda equals i. And we want to then use the result to find the basis for the eigenspace. So I started you off here uh, using a little code. The new row one that we're going to create is the expression i minus two times the original row one. You could probably see where I'm going with this, right? If I multiply that by the first row by i minus two, then I'll get an i minus two over here and I could probably make a zero underneath happen because these two will match. Now, of course, i plus two times i minus two, well, that's a simple conjugate type of multiplication, or wouldn't you know? Here we have, just from one maneuver, we have two rows that are the same. And I can get that row of zeros now very easily. My new row two, what I call row two star, will be the old row two plus negative one times row one. And that will result, if you think about it for a moment, let's see now, negative one times this row plus the bottom row. Yep, that gives me the row of zeros that I was seeking. Now I'd like to, of course, get a leading one in the upper left-hand corner so you can appreciate, I'm sure, my next code, the new row one, r sub one star, will simply be negative one-fifth, the first row that was already there. And that results in this matrix, or this linear system. And now we're ready to declare that x2 is a free variable. We only have one leading one. So if we let x2 equal the parameter t, we can express x1 as we move this to the other side. You get the additive inverse of that. And you put that in front of t, and you let x2 equal t. So this reveals to us the first eigenvector family. If we factor that t out, we'll call x vector the first eigenvector family uh, simply um, generated by multiplying this vector by some parameter t. So the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equals i is one-dimensional and consists of all 
complex scalar multiples of this basis vector. So that's our first eigenvector that will generate the first eigenvector family or eigenspace. And of course we could uh, confirm our result. We know that how eigenvalues and eigenvectors work. Uh, with the matrix A times X vector that should result in the eigenvalue, which was complex in this case, I times X vector. Now let's see how that works out with the original matrix I gave you. Negative 2, negative 1, 5, 2. So if we multiply A times that matrix, right, going through the motions of matrix multiplication, look carefully, you will see that that really does represent I times the original eigenvector that we used. Right? There you see the negative 2 fifths I, and I times I is negative 1, so 1 fifth I times I becomes negative 1 fifth, and I times 1, of course, here is I, and lo and behold, it does indeed work. Now, according to the theorem that we considered earlier, what would be the basis vector for the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equals negative I? Well, you recall that theorem said that they occur in complex conjugates, so there's no need to do extra work. We would just declare, well, X bar, the other eigenvector family, must be a, a basis for the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equals negative I. So look carefully. Here's X up here, up top. X bar means you simply put a negative in the middle instead of having a positive, and lo and behold, there's our X bar. Well, does that actually work out? We like to confirm that A times X bar really does result in lambda times X bar, and in this case, lambda equals negative I. And it doesn't take much work to show that that's exactly what happens. So if you take the two by two matrix we started with originally, multiply it, by that new eigenvector family that has the negative in the middle, the complex conjugate, you will notice that you get negative i times x bar. So in a way, it's kind of comforting to know that complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors work much the same as we dealt with real ones. We're looking for the same structure. We just got to pay attention to our complex arithmetic.